the situation closely. Uh, thank you, Senator Green. The time for um, two-minute statements has expired. We'll move to question time. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer, I refer the minister to the column written by former Labor State Secretary and former Labor Chief of Staff Cameron Milner in The Australian today, marking the anniversary of the tragic death of our former colleague Kimberly Kitching. Is Mr Milner correct that there still has not been an investigation into allegations of workplace bullying? Uh, Senator Wong. What about all those violates, guys? Uh, I'm going to ask for order, and I expect there to be order. Minister. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, look, uh, uh, this week is the anniversary of Senator Kitching's passing, uh, and uh, I would express again uh, that our thoughts are with her loved ones as that anniversary approaches. Um, it is, as I said uh, in the condolence speech, um, you know, I think I and many others in this place understand what it is to lose someone you love uh, and how anniversaries are difficult. Um, Senator Kitching was someone who was deeply interested in Australia's place in the world and I believe she would be very proud of what this Labor government is doing. She's greatly missed by many, including many of her colleagues uh, and uh, by her family. Uh, I have responded to these matters at length previously, including the question you raise, and I'd refer you to those answers. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Will the Prime Minister act on Mr Milner's call for an open and independent investigation into the bullying claims? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Uh, as I said in my earlier answer, I've responded, and as has the Prime Minister, prior to the election to these matters, and I'd refer you to those answers. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. President, can the minister please put on the record why has the Prime Minister refused to undertake an open and independent investigation? Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, these matters were traversed in great detail prior to the election, uh, including publicly, and I would refer you to the many answers which were given. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Payman. My question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is delivering on its commitment to establish 50 Medicare urgent care clinics across Australia to improve access to health care for all Australians? Minister Wong. Thank you, Senator Pates Payman, and thank you very much for the question and the opportunity to talk about something that Australians are deeply interested in, which is the strength of the Australian healthcare system, and in particular, the Medicare system. Australians expect and deserve access to quality and affordable health care, and that is what our, government, what our government and those on this side are seeking to deliver, because we are the party of Medicare. We are the party of Medicare, and we have always supported Medicare, unlike those opposite who we know historically opposed Medicare, historically opposed Medicare, and have had grudgingly over the years, grudgingly over the years, to start to tell people uh, that they actually support it because they, because they knew it was politically unsustainable for them to continue to oppose it. So four decades on, the party that created Medicare is strengthening it. We promised at the election that we would deliver 50 Medicare urgent care clinics, and we are delivering. We are delivering. Expressions of interest have opened, and the first of the clinics will be treating patients this year. Uh, they will offer bulk build services Order. and open for extended Order. hours. You hate this, don't you? You hate this. You, you, do, you, you hate this. You, 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 really, uh, you really hate Australians getting access to better health care. You know, you, you know, the fact that people actually believe that a public health system is a good thing. It's anathema to the Liberal it's Party, isn't it? And they don't want to know. I have they don't want to know. They don't want to know how how this government is strengthening to it. And remember, let's remember. You know, this is a party who is led by a man who cut fifty billion dollars from hospitals. Peter Dutton, as health minister, fifty billion cut from hospitals. Tried to introduce a seven dollar GP tax Senator and secretly Cash launched. And Senator Rustin, <coughs> order. Uh, Senator Payman, uh, first supplementary. 
had you, sorry. Nationals, our 50 urgent care clinics will help take the burden off public hospitals. Order, Senator Payne. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question, and I'm waiting for silence. Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is working with states and territories to strengthen access to primary care? Minister Wong. Thank you. Thank you to Senator Payment for the question. And of course, we on this side understand that the pandemic made clear that governments need to work together, work together, to deliver the care Australians deserve. That's why, that's why our government uh, delivers, is committed $100 million to co-develop and pilot innovative ways to improve care with states and territories. In Queensland, the government is using the funding to expand its care collective initiative. This will improve coordination in the health system, specifically for people living with chronic and complex health care needs. In Western Australia, the nurse practitioner and team-based care pilot will fund 20 nurse practitioners over two years. Practitioners who will work with other uh, well, you know, I'll take the interjection from the other side. You know, I would have thought you'd be interested. I would have thought you'd be interested in what's happening in Western Australia and Queensland, but clearly not. These practitioners will work with other health professionals to diagnose and treat Senator a wide Rustin. range of health conditions, Senator and their Rustin. services will be free. Uh, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on how else the government is delivering on its commitment to strengthen Medicare? after 10 years of neglect and mismanagement by the Liberals and Nationals. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the government is strengthening Medicare, which is required after nine years of cuts and neglect, and we've set up the Strengthening Medicare Cut Task Force to help better support patients with ongoing and chronic illness. We have already committed $750 million to deliver the highest priority investments in primary care in line with the recommendations of the task force. But you know, after a decade of failure, there is a lot of work to do. There is a lot of work to do, because those opposite left Australians with a trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. Hospitals left under strain, medical staff exhausted, the bulk billing system on the verge of collapse, and out-of-pocket costs skyrocketing. Well, I suppose we should Senator expect Rustin. nothing more, nothing better, from a man who was described as Australia's worst health minister. Mr Dutton, Australia's worst health minister. This is the man who now leads Mr Morrison's Liberal leftovers. Uh, thank you, Minister. Your opposition time. of today, thank Mr you, Morrison's Minister. Your Liberal... time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday, the Assistant Treasurer could not rule out that if a family farm is an asset in a self-managed super fund, the owners could be forced to pay tax on that farm if it increased in value during a particular financial year. Minister, can you confirm that your government is proposing to tax super fund assets such as the family farm where it has only been where there has only been an increase in its value on paper. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a moment. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. Um, Senator Brockman, who was the question to? Senator Gallagher. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank um, Senator Brockman for the question. I've answered this a number of times uh, this week. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yes, um, I Minister, have. Minister, please, you have asked Minister the Gallagher, same please, question please a number of times. Oh, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, I've just sat the minister down because there's too much in too many interjections. Uh, minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Yes, I have been asked this. I've been asked it in various ways. Yes, I have. Uh, superannuation. Uh, is based on individual accounts. If your account has more than $3 million in it, of which we know is a very small part of the overall numbers of superannuation accounts, then we are increasing the, or decreasing the concessional arrangements on those high balance accounts. Right? 
So if, you're, if you have an asset in your super account, you are still required under the prudential arrangements to have a diversified portfolio that would have been the case under your government. and you earn income that tips you over the $3 million threshold, then you will pay a concessional rate of 30 per cent instead of 15 per cent on the earnings over $3 million. Now, this would cover people Senator who have a farm as part of their asset or it might include other uh, other property that they might have in their super funds. Uh, so um, I think that is how that, that is the answer I give. That is the answer I've given all week, um, and that is the position we've taken through these super changes. But I would note again that the average super balance in this country is $150,000. To have a dignified retirement is in the order of $565,000. That is what superannuation is for, to, to allow for a dignified retirement. This is making a Thank modest you, Minister, change your time for has a very— expired. Uh, Senator, I'm going to wait for quiet. I have a senator on his feet. Senator Rustin. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Minister, for that one minute and 30 second yes. Minister, the Assistant Treasurer recently likened the $3 trillion in superannuation funds in Australia as honey, which he wants to spread around for the good of the hive. Do you believe that accounts are the property of the individual account holder, or do you believe or do you agree with the Assistant Treasurer that they are a uh, honeypot Senator Brockman, your time for the government to spread? Minister Gallagher. I think I got the gist of it. I think I got the gist of it. Superannuation. Superannuation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sit. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. I'm going to wait until the interjections have stopped from both sides of the chamber. Senator Mackenzie. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Superannuation accounts are individual accounts owned by individual members, uh, which are subject to taxation, as they currently are. Uh, they are. Superannuation currently has ta tax arrangements that apply to it. What the change that we are making, the change Order. that we are making, is for a very small amount of Senator people McGrath. who are fortunate enough to have more than $3 million in their accounts, that they pay a concessional rate of 30 per cent on earnings over $3 million. It's a very modest, uh, modest change to the arrangements that have been put in place. But as, as people in this place know, superannuation is based on individual accounts. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, uh, the minister spent 95 per cent of her answer uh, responding to really the primary question still and the general thesis around the government superannuation changes. On relevance, the supplementary question went specifically to the words of the assistant treasurer, which she should reject uh, that it is not a honeypot uh, to, for the, to be spread around the nation. Um, Senator Birmingham, as I uh, order, order, I'm responding to a point of order. As I understand the question, it, it did have the honey definition in it, but the senator was also asked directly if um, senator accounts, uh, superannuation accounts, were individual. So I believe she's being relevant, but I will continue to listen. Minister, you've finished. Um, senator Brockman, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, yesterday in question time, when asked to categorically rule out any further changes to the superannuation taxation system in this parliament, you said, and I quote, the government has made it clear that this is the only change to superannuation taxation during this term. Considering during the 22 election campaign, Mr Albanese said, we've said we've had no intention of making any changes to super. How can the Australian people trust the commitment you gave yesterday? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, my answer yesterday was correct. Uh, I stand by that answer, uh, and I would say uh, that the Australian people realise that they have a government that's making responsible and difficult decisions after we inherited a budget mess 
from those opposite. That is what the Australian people think. They want a government that shows up, that deals with the challenges, that explains, explains the decisions we take and why we take them. And we're taking them because we've got a $50 billion structural budget problem in this country. We have a trillion dollars in debt that was the debt that was doubled before the uh, pandemic hit. We've got increasing pressures on our budget, including in national uh, security and defence, and in health, and in hospitals, and in aged care. All of those areas, increasing pressures. And unlike you, we don't think the budget is this ma magic pudding uh, uh, that you, you use for yourself Your time has explaining expired. it. Order. Minister, resume your seat. Your time has expired. Order. 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 Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watts, representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. Minister, the federal government and Safe Work have been on notice about the deadly health impacts posed by manufactured stones since at least 2019, when the matter was canvassed extensively in a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry and the press. We know too many workers are dying slow, painful deaths from silicosis. Recognising that it, had that it took us too long to act on James Hardy, why does Safe Work still say high silica manufactured stone can be sa used safely and still refuse to support a ban on this deadly product? Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. And I know this is an issue you've had a long-standing interest in, uh, as have many of us. Uh, who have been concerned about worker safety, particularly in the construction industry, where this applies most. Uh, and I agree with you, Senator Shoebridge. This is something that should have been dealt with a long, long time ago. Uh, a lot of people have been on notice that this is a problem and is a very serious health risk. Um, I've heard it referred to as the asbestosis of this generation, and that, that is certainly what it looks like. And that's exactly why our government is taking action uh, to finally fix this once and for all. Uh, as, as you would probably be aware, Senator Shoebridge, uh, in late February, the 28th of February this year, Minister Burke, as the responsible minister, met with work health and safety ministers to consider Safe Work Australia's decision regulation impact statement to better manage the risks of silica dust within the workplace. At that meeting, ministers unanimously agreed to a national approach to dealing with the spike in silicosis and silica-related diseases in workers from harmful exposure of respirable crystalline uh, silica. Ministers agreed uh, to a range of reforms as a priority based on recommendations from Safe Work Australia, and they included the delivery of national awareness and behaviour change initiatives, stronger regulation of high-risk crystalline or crystalline silica processes for all materials across all industries, and further analysis and consultation by Safe Work Australia on a prohibition on the use of engineered stone under the model workplace health and safety laws including consideration of a licensing scheme for legacy and non-prohibited products to be completed within six months. Ministers also noted the Commonwealth's intent to explore an importation ban on engineered stone and its effects, and Minister Burke's department is now working with states and territories and other stakeholders as part of this scoping work. Uh, we recognise the need to act quickly, and ministers will meet again to discuss silicosis as soon as practicable. Thank you, Minister. After the time for answering has work. expired. Senator Shubik, first uh, supplementary. Minister, the main provider of manufactured stone in Australia, Caesar Stone, is a foreign corporation with no significant assets in the country, and since September 2020 has been unable to get insurance coverage for silicosis-related claims in Australia, while it's also facing dozens and dozens of claims from sick and dying Australian workers. What guarantee do you give to workers who become sick after working with this product that they will not be left high and dry if Caesar Stone exits the market? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, as I say, a range of issues uh, concerning silicosis and the threat that it poses to workers in the construction industry, uh, including those who unfortunately have contracted silicosis, are exactly the issues that Minister Burke is dealing with at the moment. Uh, and I understand that you're seeking an assurance or, or some information about what will happen uh, to workers who become sick uh, if, if Caesar Stone were to exit the market. Uh, I'm not briefed on that precise matter, but I'm happy to provide you with some information about that. Thank you, Senator uh, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, I note that the, the statement's about taking action, and, um, and to some extent that's positive. 
But the, the best estimates we're hearing from the minister is this could be six to 12 months before a ban is put in place. So what do you say to the families of those workers who are getting sick now, waiting for a ban to finally happen, and being told again, we're going to the beat of safe work, and it's too hard to do it now, and that industry controls are sufficient? What do you Thank say you, about the failure Shoebridge, to get a ban now? Your time now? has expired. Senator Watt. Um, thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. I don't think that anyone, or certainly no one within our government, is saying that the current controls are sufficient. Uh, and that's exactly why Minister Burke is leading this work nationally, involving all state and territory ministers. Uh, I think it is not just unfortunate, but a grave dereliction of duty from the former government to have been in power for nearly 10 years while this information was publicly available and, do, and did nothing about it. And within the first 12 months of our government, we are actually taking action. Um, we do, so what I say to the families of those workers who are getting sick now is that they do now have a government in the Albanese Labor government who takes these issues seriously uh, and is actually taking action. Uh, well, Senator Heads and Anderson, it, it would have been good if you'd spoken up at some point, at any point while you were in government. Uh, to ensure that this was done. Uh, but now that we are in government, we are taking action on it. Uh, and, and the sooner that that can happen, the better. Thank you, uh, Minister Watts. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Watt. Can the minister outline why international education is, is important to our economy and building relationships with other countries? Minister Watt. Thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Billick. And I know you're a very strong supporter of the international education industry in your home state of Tasmania and right around the country. Uh, a strong international education sector is an important contributor to the Australian economy. It's in fact the biggest export that we don't dig out of the ground, uh, but of course this industry was absolutely smashed by COVID. In 2019, international education contributed over $40 billion to the Australian economy and supported over 250,000 jobs. The pandemic saw that fall to $20.8 billion in 2021-22, so nearly halved. International education has recently returned to being Australia's fourth biggest export industry, now worth $25.5 billion, but obviously there's still a very large gap between where we were before COVID came along. International education also plays a role in filling Australia's skill needs uh, with high quality graduates trained to Australian standards. Our government's work to reduce the visa backlog, another mess we inherited from the former government, and increase post-study work rights will help attract the best and brightest to Australian shores. International students are starting to come back and that's a very good thing, uh, but there is a lot more work to be done here. And that's why the work that the Minister for Education, Jason Clare, uh, has done and the Prime Minister is doing India right now is so important. International education directly progresses Australia's interests in a stable and prosperous future for our region. The deep and enduring connections that result from international students studying and living in Australia brings more than revenue, it builds us friends in the region and beyond. International students help to strengthen Australia's international relationships. They are an invaluable part of Australian communities, bringing new perspectives, ideas and skills to enrich the cultural fabric of our society. Edu education plays a key role in building cultural diversity and people-to-people -people links around the world. It also ensures re regional stability, and that's some of the many reasons Thank why you, our Minister. government is supporting it. Thank you, Minister. The time it. for answering has expired. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Can you provide an update on what the Albanese government is doing to strengthen higher education ties with India? Minister. Thank you, President. And yes, I can, Senator Billick. Uh, as you would be aware, our government takes the relationship between Australia and India very seriously, and that is a strong and important relationship for our future. I know that's certainly the case in my own portfolio of agriculture, uh, and the recently signed free trade agreement with India opens lots of new markets for agricultural producers in India. Uh, but I think that education is also a big part of the reason why this relationship is continuing to grow. The Prime Minister's announcement overnight that Deakin University will be the first overseas university approved to build a campus in India is proof of the strength of our relationship, and I'm sure all Victorian senators in particular uh, are very proud of that. The Minister for Education's visit last week, thank you, Senator Ciccone, the Minister for Education's visit last week to sign the new mutual recognition agreement is further proof of that. 
It delivers an immediate benefit to the hundreds of thousands of Indians with Australian qualifications and to anyone with Australian and Indian qualifications that wants to continue their higher education. This agreement was the broadest that India Thank has you, signed Senator with another White, country. The time for answering has expired. Senator Bullock, second supplementary. Minister, what are the benefits to Australia of the work the Prime Minister is doing on higher education in India? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Billick, and I'll <coughs> just <coughs> clear my throat as <coughs> Senator Farrell is wont to do. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> our relationship with <coughs> India presents massive opportunities for Australia, both for our economy and for the people, to people for the people that people links it generates. The Indian government has a plan to increase its higher education enrolments to 50 per cent of young people by 2035. Uh, the, the quality of our universities and the strength of our relationship has led India to <laughs> ask for our help in getting this huge undertaking done. Following recent visits, we will see more Australian education providers established in India. The University of Wollongong and Deakin University have committed to establish campuses in Gujarat and will be education partners for the many companies operating uh, in Gift City and surrounds. Uh, RMIT University and the Birla Institute of Technology uh, Polani signed an agreement, and there are 11 memoranda of understanding signed between Australian universities and, and Indian counterparts. We're going to do Thank a lot you, more Senator in this space. Watt. It's really Your important. time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. I appreciate it. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Industry, and I believe it's Senator Watt. Um, the Albanese government has earmarked up to $3 billion from the National Reconstruction Fund for investment in renewables and low emissions technologies. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation's investment mandate for its $10 billion is to invest in, quote, renewable energy, low emissions and energy efficiency projects and technologies, end quote. My question is, what can the National Reconstruction Fund's $3 billion for renewables invest in that the CFC can't already do? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watts. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, as I understand it, you're um, yet to uh, finalise your position in relation to the National Reconstruction Fund, so I do hope that the information that I provide you can convince you that this is something worth getting behind. Uh, the little I know about you, because we haven't spent a lot of time together, I do know that you're a big supporter of manufacturing, uh, particularly in your home state of Tasmania, uh, and the National Reconstruction Fund will be a key way uh, to take manufacturing in that great state forward. Uh, I know Senator Urquhart has a lot of history in Tasmanian manufacturing, uh, and I'm sure, Senator Tyrrell, you'll um, support that as well when we, when we come down to it. The short answer to your question, Senator Tyrrell, uh, is that the National Reconstruction Fund is going to be very focused on manufacturing, uh, and a good example of that in the, in the renewable space might be uh, a smelter, whether it be Bell Bay or anywhere else in Tasmania, or another manufacturing facility that might wish to change its energy sources to become more reliant on renewable energies as a way of reducing their energy costs. That is the type of thing that we would expect a company would be able to apply to the National Reconstruction Fund for co-investment. Uh, and if the right rate of return was available, then the NRF would be able to support that. It's a bit different to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, I guess, because that is much more focused on funding new innovation in the renewable energy space, so around the production of renewable energy uh, and how we can do that through new and innovative, innovative means. So National Reconstruction Fund, much more focused on manufacturing facilities, how to upgrade them, how to bring more value-adding, how to reduce their energy costs rather than the CEFC, which is more about how can we develop more renewable energy, uh, which could then be used to supply to manufacturing facilities. Uh, but as I say, Senator Tyrrell, um, we think that it's a really, uh, it will be, make a massive difference for manufacturing in our country and in your state of Tasmania. So I do hope that when it comes time to the vote, you'll support us. And that's why Thank you, Minister Watt. Um, Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Uh, order, order, Senator Ayres and others. Senator Tyrrell. Thanks, President. Uh, the Medical Research Endowment Account is investing $3.5 billion in health and medical research. The $20 billion Medical Research Future Fund invests in commercialising those new medical technologies. Can the minister give an example of the, something the National Reconstruction Fund's $1.5 billion for medical science can invest in that the government's other investment vehicles can't already invest in? 
Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, my understanding, bearing in mind I'm representing Minister, is that the answer is essentially the same. Uh, if, if what I'm about to say is not entirely correct, I'm obviously happy to give you the precise information. But my understanding is that, just as with clean energy, the National Reconstruction Fund will be focused on medical manufacturing, whether that be the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, of medical devices, vaccines, or the actual manufacturing process, and how that can be done more efficiently, generating more jobs and more profits in states like yours, uh, whereas the, med uh, the, the medical research fund that you were talking about is more focused on funding the research for discovery of new vaccines, of new medicines and things like that, rather than actually manufacturing them. So I guess the National Reconstruction Fund can take those discoveries one step further. And rather than having great medical discoveries here in Australia that then get manufactured overseas, we can make more things here in Australia, which we agree with. Unfortunately, there's a few people over there who don't. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Okay. The Albanese government has earmarked a further $1 billion from the NRF towards advanced manufacturing and a separate billion dollars for critical technologies. But your critical technologies list includes advanced manufacturing as a category of critical technology. It's the first category. You've decided to set up separate buckets of money for different things, but a dollar spent in the first counts as a dollar spent in the second. Do you see how that might be confusing? Oh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, again, I might need to get a little bit more information to fully answer your question, but my understanding is that the critical technologies list is, is, already, is under review, hasn't been finalised. Um, there's obviously a consultation process that, that has been going through in the creation of this fund, the settling of guidelines as to the types of things that it can be invested in, that you can, can be used to invest in. Uh, and, and I'm sure that if there is any lack of clarity there, that will be tidied up through the, uh, the review process. Um, while I'm on my feet, though, I do want to just point out that this is going to be a really important vote for our country when we come to vote on this legislation. I'm pleased to see that the Greens have now announced that they will be supporting that legislation. Uh, uh, I think the crossbench are still working out their position, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. But there's, there's, there's actually two groups, the Liberals and the Nationals, who are completely opposed to this. And that for all the time they run around dressing in high vis, uh, pretending to care about manufacturing and smearing a bit of grease on their face, when it comes to the crunch, they vote against it. That's a Thank disgrace. Thank you, Minister White. Your time shame. has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, on Monday this week, in response to a question from Senator Bragg, you said, and I quote, "Because of the nature of defined benefits, they will be included in the scheme." And we announced that when we announced the measure. We expect that the changes will definitely uh, cover defined benefit schemes, and there are a couple of areas that we are going to consult on and that we want some industry advice on. Can the minister confirm that veterans who are eligible to access a defined benefit scheme will be caught up in Labor's new super tax? Mm. Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and I, I think because I've been dealing with um, these questions all week, and uh, I would point out to the chamber that the coalition closed the defined benefits superannuation scheme for the military in 2015. But we have been clear. Uh, but we have been clear that defined benefit schemes will be part of this change. We said that when we announced it and we will consult with the sector on implementation. And I welcome the opportunity to go through, and I think I might start uh, with the member for Hume's uh, comments about, uh, which relates to um, high balance accounts um, back in 2016. Well, it's very simple. We need a fairer superannuation system which has integrity. And this means that those of us who can afford to pay should be paying our fair share. The situation we had was some people were contributing millions of dollars into super, and it's totally inappropriate that someone who's contributed millions and millions of dollars continues to get 15 per cent, 15 per cent concessions. Um, that was the member for Hume in 2016. That was the member for Hume in 2016. And now we've got. We've got a sensible, modest, responsible change that deals with fairness and equity in the superannuation Order. system. And 
those opposite, the party of the member for Hume, all of a sudden, all of a sudden are going to die on a hill for a less concessional arrangement for 0.5 per cent of people who are fortunate enough to have more than $3 million in their super account. That is the Senator state Hume. of the Liberal Party. As we work towards some sensible budget repair, some modest changes, the no coalition making Thank themselves Minister, irrelevant, your time say has no. Expired. Uh, just order, order. Senator Hume, your constant interjections are disorderly, and I called you to order a number of times. I expect you to come to order. Senator O'Sullivan, our first supplementary. Thank you, Thank you President. Uh, Minister, given your answer, will you rule out applying the tax to veterans who, defined, uh, who accessed the defined benefit scheme prior to 2015? Uh, Minister. Uh, the, the policy that we've announced and will be reflected in the budget applies to 0.5 per cent of people who have more than $3 million in their superannuation account. Okay? In their superannuation account. Now, we are looking at how we apply it to defined benefit schemes. Order. We are looking at how we do it. Uh, Minister, um, please resume your seat. Senator Wong and others. Minister, please continue. As I said earlier this week, and as I've just repeated, we've been clear that we want this to apply to defined benefit schemes as well. If you are fortunate enough to have $3 million in your super account, we think that paying a less applying a less concessional arrangement, still highly concessional, still highly concessional, just less than is currently available, so 30 per cent instead of 15, that, that raising a very modest $2 billion when it's fully operational Thank you, to Minister, contribute your time to budget expired. repair. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Uh, thank you for that very revealing answer. Uh, why is Labor, therefore, going after veterans and attempting to tax them on earnings that they won't receive until they retire? I am waiting for order before I call the minister. Senator Wong. Order. Minister. The average super balance in this country is $150,000. That is the average super balance in this country. Women, for women, it is less than that. The average superannuation minister, balance is $140,000. Order. Senator Wong. Minister. We are not going after anyone. We are implementing a sensible change. Well, we are implementing. I wish. I wish you got so exercised Order. about all the other issues facing the country, like the state of the budget that we inherited, for example, might be one of them. Senator How Green. we fund some of those pressures that we've inherited. All of those zombie measures that you left there for years, propping up your budget, your terminating measures. Senator Henderson. The, what about energy bill relief? Why didn't you care about that? Well, why didn't you care uh, about Minister, that? Minister, you voted no. Minister, you voted no. Minister, we were please here. resume your we're seat. Minister, Minister, order, order, order. 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 S Minister Gallagher. This is the second time this week that this chamber has been so disorderly you have not heard me say order on a number of times. It's question time. It is disorderly and disrespectful to continue to call out and to call out so loudly that my saying order is drowned out. It's question time. I expect senators to respect that. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the health minister, Mr Gallagher. We meet again, Mr. Um, 
Minister Gallagher. Last time we conversed in this chamber, you said in relation to COVID-19 vaccines, and I quote, it's not just an individual decision. This is the thing. It's not just about an individual's decision and keeping yourself safe. It's keeping other people safe from this virus. People who aren't able to be as protected as some of us. It's actually a community responsibility to be vaccinated. You also repeated this during Senate estimates. Minister, can you please advise what evidence you have relied upon to justify your statements regarding mRNA vaccinations and their effectiveness against transmission of the currently circulating COVID strain? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Senator Bibbett. Minister. Thank you, and I thank the Senator uh, for the question and also for the advice that he, early advice that he was going to ask a question about uh, the vaccine or about COVID-19. By getting vac vaccinated and staying up to date with booster doses, people are helping to protect their communities. They, by, they do this by reducing their own risk of serious and severe disease and they are reducing the potential burden on their local health service and maintaining their ability to work and provide care for others. At the initial stage of the vaccine, at the initial stage of the pandemic, um, there was also the push through the vaccination program to ensure uh, essentially a herd immunity to the virus, which is simple, which is similar. Uh, to the approach that we take with the other vaccination programs. And my comments relate uh, to that. Um, anyone who undertakes a vaccination uh, for a particular illness or disease is doing it as a member of a community um, because quite often those diseases won't, won't necessarily uh, give us severe illness. But for those who are vulnerable, for those who are immunocompromised, um, they could be affected. And so I do see uh, vaccination as a community responsibility. And there is no doubt that by having the vaccines, it is preventing serious disease from occurring uh, to people and preventing deaths, and has been instrumental in allowing society to open both socially and economically. Uh, before I call Senator Babette, I'll remind senators once again that the conversations across the chamber are disorderly. And it is Senator Babette's opportunity to ask questions and for the minister to respond. Senator Babette, uh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. So we've now had over 11 million COVID cases that have been reported in Australia, and most Australians by now have some level of natural immunity or they've been vaccinated. Now, even New South Wales Premier Mr Dominic Perrottet recently said that there's no evidence that vaccines prevent transmission or impact transmission. Uh, you know, potentially, I think you may have misled the Senate. Now, let's go back to the, to the uh, very start, specifically Pfizer. Did Pfizer test whether the COVID-19 vaccine prevented transmission before rolling it out? Uh, thank you, Senator Bitt. Senator Ayres, I've called you to order a number of times during question time. I'm asking you to respect when I call you to order and not continue to call out. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, President. On the issue of uh, Pfizer and whether the vaccine was uh, tested for uh, to, in response to its ability to prevent community transmission, I will have to take that on notice. Happy, happy to come back. But it was. A, I mean, I think we do have to understand that uh, the approval processes for these vaccines were done uh, very quickly in the eye of a pandemic. Uh, they followed the safety. Uh, procedures as required, and the TGA had a rigorous assessment process for approval of those vaccines. And there is no doubt that the vaccines have helped prevent serious illness and death in thousands and thousands of Australians. I mean, I think you're very fortunate if you've had COVID and you haven't had serious disease and it hasn't required hospitalisation or caused your death. But failing to vaccinate people would have resulted in a lot more deaths. It uh, thank would you, have. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Bibet, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Obviously, you failed to answer my question there, but I believe that your government continues to fail many Australians by not outlawing vaccine mandates. Now, you've got an opportunity here to make up for the previous government's failure, the previous Liberal government's mistakes. So I'll ask you one more time, you know, uh, do you believe that you've misled the Senate around your comments regarding community responsibility and the vaccines? Are you willing to retract those comments? Uh, Minister. 
Thank you, President. I don't believe I have misled the Senate, and I take um, the remarks I make in this place really seriously. Like it, um, around that, um, I do believe that vaccination is a community responsibility. I do believe it. If we all went around unvaccinated, there would be a whole range of diseases and illnesses in this country. And whilst it might not affect many of us in this chamber, although it would affect some of us, if you are immunocompromised, then the fact that people aren't vaccinated could have a significant and serious Senator effect Rennick. on your own health. Science, like that is that is the reality. That's the approach we take with the childhood vaccination program. It's the approach that Senator we've taken Watt. with the pandemic, and there is no doubt. And despite Senator Rennick's interjections, there is evidence because the mortality rate from COVID is significantly reduced now that we have a highly vaccinated population. The evidence is in on that. Uh, Senator Rennick, I called you to order a number of times. There's ample opportunity during the week for you to put your opinion about a whole variety of questions and matters. Question time is not one of those. Uh, Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the committee is ensuring, sorry, on how the government is ensuring Australia's biggest emitters contribute their fair share towards emission reductions? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Watt. That's Minister Watt. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Pratt for her question and for her advocacy over many, many years, like many on this side, for action on climate. And, uh, the government safeguard mechanism reforms uh, are really the first chance in over a decade, yes. over a decade mm -hmm. for us to implement climate action that gets us towards net zero. And that's yeah. really the important thing is that how do we get towards the target how do we get to the targets uh, that have been set that I, I, I thought that the opposition supported, but uh, more about them shortly. Uh, and Australian businesses are, are pleading for it because they know that reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness in a global net zero economy. We want to deliver sensible pro-climate reforms that the Australian people voted for and that business needs so they can reduce emissions. But those opposite, and really I think Senator Canavan is demonstrating it now, they, were, they, they oppose reforms because they, there is a pathology of political conflict over there. You're not interested in solutions. You're not actually interested in, in, in reducing emissions. You're not interested in, in actually having a, 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 market, a, a, a mechanism which enables the market to have certainty so we can deliver net zero which supposedly, supposedly you, you support in principle. You're not interested in that, but you are interested uh, in having conflict. The same old fights reheated for 2023. But of course, you have to ask the opposition, who are they actually fighting for? Who are you actually fighting for? You're not fighting for business. You're not fighting for businesses because we know the business community Senator support Wong, it. You're Senator not fighting Wong, for working order. Australians. You oppose order. both new jobs and secure jobs, order. whether it's the minimum Thank you. Please continue, Senator Wong. You're not fighting for working Australians. You oppose new jobs in your opposition to the National Reconstruction Fund, and you oppose a boost of the minimum wage, and you're not fighting for families because you voted no to energy price relief just weeks before Christmas. So the question Thank to you, you is Senator whose Wong, side your are time you on? For answering has expired. I'm going to wait until there's silence before I call Senator Pratt. Senator Mackenzie. It seems to be a habit of yours that the minute I call order, you continue to call out. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. President, can the minister highlight the opportunities presented by the Albanese government's plans and what the potential costs of squandering those opportunities would be? Minister Wong. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Um uh, Senator Pratt, and, and you're right. These are uh, these are uh, plans where there are, is a great deal of cost to all of us across the economy, across the community, if those opportunities are squandered. And I'd remind the chamber that the proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism have been carefully designed, following ne nearly six months of consultation, and it has broad support across the community. 
Uh, and if I could go back to my first answer, which is, you know, what, who are the, you know, what are you fighting for? Because you, you, you know, you, you're fighting against business, you're fighting against working families, you're fighting against those on the minimum wage. But you know, they're actually even fighting themselves. They're actually fighting themselves because these are reforms that were first proposed by. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, these are the same reforms that your party room uh, signed off, and you're so determined to pick a fight, you're actually fighting against your own policy. So, so determined to pick a fight, you're even fighting against your own policy. Order, order. At Senator Watt and Senator Rennick. Um, Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister please outline the impact of the Albanese government's proposed reforms and the impact that will have on certainty of investment and, any, and what threats there may be to that certainty? Thank you. Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Pratt. And uh, we on this side of the chamber understand that without certainty the market doesn't move. Uh, and if you want a demonstration of that, you can see the failed, 22 failed policies of those yep. opposite, uh, and the way that smashed investment uh, in the in the uh, generation sector. Uh, and businesses know that. Uh, and I refer to recent oh, okay. media this week. Uh, where there was a headline in the AFR saying coalition blocking the best shot at net, net zero success, where it was reported that big business, big business has urged the federal opposition to back the government's safeguard mechanism requiring big polluters to bring down emissions, warning a lack of bipartisan support could jeopardise um, the enormous Wong, private investment. Minister Wong, Minister Wong uh, order, order. I have a senator on his feet. Order, um, Minister, uh, Senator Watt. Um, point of order, uh, President. I just draw your attention to the fact that Senator Rennick continues Pre to try to disrupt Senator the Watt. procedures, Senator despite Watt. your repeated requests not to. Senator Watt, order, 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 Senator Watt. Senator Watt, order. That is not a point of order. Um, Minister Wong, please continue. I can't remember where I was. <laughs> uh, so what, I mean, what we have is business themselves saying that your lack of bipartisan support could jeopardise, and I quote, the enormous private investment needed for the clean energy transition. I mean, you're, you, are, you are seeking to again uh, to just you, be Senator reckless. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time you're has reckless. expired. Senator Patterson, first. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security, Senator Watt. The European Union, Canada, the United States, and other jurisdictions have banned TikTok on government devices because they regard the risk posed by the app as unacceptable. Overnight, the director of the FBI reaffirmed the serious threat of backdoor espionage and interference from TikTok. Of 53 Australian government departments and agencies who responded, only 25, less than half, confirmed an outright ban. Why has the Albanese government not followed our like-minded partners and banned the app on government devices? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, it is interesting. I, I, I recognise that Senator Patterson is someone here who does take issues of cybersecurity and national security seriously, uh, but I can't help noticing that he and all of his colleagues have taken a lot more interest in these issues since they entered opposition than they ever did when they were in power and had the opportunity to do so. Uh, I also observe that poor old Senator Rennick up the back there, he never seems to get a question, and maybe one day he'll get the opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, the fact is that since our government, the Albanese government, has been in power, we have absolutely lifted the game of the Australian government when it comes to cyber security to move beyond the derelict system that was left behind by the former government. The Albanese government is committed to ensuring all Australians are aware of the challenges of protecting themselves online. And as I say, 
as I say, all the people who now have all the questions in the world had, have am had ample opportunity to do something about this issue themselves as members of a nearly 10-year-old government that ended only a few months ago. It wasn't that long ago that Senator Patterson was asking me questions about the cameras uh, that are in departmental buildings, and again, something that the former government not only could have done something about but maybe could have stopped happening in the first place. Uh, so I welcome this newfound interest in these issues from members of the opposition, including Senator Patterson, uh, and I would welcome the support uh, of the opposition to the reforms that this government is putting, putting in place. Uh, Minister uh, Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Patterson. Uh, on relevance, Madam President, my question was about TikTok. We're one minute, one minute and 30 seconds into the minister's answer, and the word TikTok has not passed his lips. Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Um, I'm, I am going to direct the minister uh, to the question, but I'll go to Senator Wong. If you've made the order, there's no point. Um, Minister, um, Senator Patterson asked specific questions about government departments in relation to TikTok, and um, I need you to be relevant to that question. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, well, as I think uh, Senator Patterson is aware, the Minister for Home Affairs is conducting a review of all social media platforms, and the government will consider the recommendations of that review, a review I might say never occurred under the former government. Uh, the concerns regarding TikTok are not new, uh, and they've been in public for some time. And again, there could have been something done about this by the former government if they thought that it was actually a concern. Um, but as I say, the minister is conducting this review. The Attorney General has also requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required to address uh, protective security Watt. risks. Thank you, Minister Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. In July last year, TikTok Australia first admitted in a letter to me that Australian TikTok user data can be accessed in China. In December, the company admitted to using the app to spy on journalists. Why has the Albanese government failed to act for eight months on this important cybersecurity matter? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson, Minister. Seriously, eight, why have we not acted within eight months when you're part of a government that was in power for nearly 10 years? Uh, and, and, you know, why were you asleep at the wheel on these issues uh, amongst Minister everything Watt? else for Minister nearly Watt, eight years? Please resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator Patterson is entitled to have his question answered, and I would ask you on my left in particular to respect the quiet minister. Thank you, President. Uh, unlike the succession of failed former coalition governments, the Albanese Labor government is taking a considered, deliberate approach to better regulating how digital platforms access and store consumer information. Uh, the Minister for Home Affairs has asked her department to consider all options to address data access and usage concerns as they relate to TikTok and other social media companies. I don't recall the former government ever doing that, uh, but this minister and this government has done so. Uh, the concerns about the security of Australians' data on social media are well known, and they are not limited to TikTok. Current policy and legislative settings do not give Australians the information or the confidence that their personal data is being protected and secu uh, stored securely, and we're doing something Thank about you, it. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Will the minister commit to a time frame to ban TikTok from government devices? Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, well, as I say, the minister is undertaking that review, but what I can guarantee you is that this government will do something about this well within the nearly 10 years, uh, that timeline, that your government sat on its hands and did nothing about these things. Uh, I truly hope that we are in power Order. for that sort of length of time. Uh, but however long it takes, we're going to get this Order. done. We've already started work on it within our first 12 months in office, as opposed uh, to the former government, which did absolutely nothing for nearly 10 years, and all of a sudden has become wise after the fact. Uh, if only, if only you'd had this sort of insight when you were in government. If only. But 10 years went by, nothing was done, uh, and now, yet again, mess that we've got to clean up. So I have every confidence that this minister and this government will take action as quickly as possible to address these issues. The reviews are underway. The Attorney General is seeking advice, things that never occurred under the former government. We take national security seriously. We take cyber security seriously, and that's why we're acting on it. Thank you, um, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Last year, nearly 70 per cent of Australians lived in a natural disaster zone. Can the Minister outline what steps the Albanese government is taking to make sure Australians are better prepared and better protected for natural disasters? 
Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Sheldon, uh, for, about another, for another question on an issue that I know you're very uh, interested in uh, and work very hard on. And I might, just before I directly answer the question, just note that yet again in Northern Australia uh, we are facing some very serious rainfall, particularly in the Northern Territory uh, and northwest Queensland over coming days, an area that I know Senator Macdonald is very familiar with. Uh, Senator McGreen, I think, has spoken about this issue as well, and I know that all of our well wishes go to people in those areas to stay safe. Uh, please remain aware of emergency warnings in coming days and, of course, uh, that famous slogan that too many people ignore, if it's flooded, forget it. Um, so let's all take care over the coming days. But, Senator Sheldon, uh, as you know, uh, the Albanese government knows that as Australia faces more intense and more frequent natural disasters due to climate change, we need to be better prepared. And that's why we've established the Disaster Ready Fund, our flagship Disaster Resilience and Mitigation Fund. The Disaster Ready Fund will invest up to $200 million in federal funding every year uh, in disaster mitigation and resilience measures. And where possible, that funding will be matched by states, territories and local governments where they are partners in these projects. Now, these measures that this fund will provide the funding for could be used for everything from seawalls to evacuation centres and drainage improvements uh, to things like community preparedness plans and training programs. And I'm pleased to say that applications for the first round of our new Disaster Ready Fund closed on Monday this week, and they are now being assessed by an independent panel. Now, that funding won't become available until 1 July this year, but we've deliberately got moving quickly early in this year so that we're ready to go uh, once that time frame arrives. We also know that we need targeted support for communities still recovering from the devastating 2022 February-March floods, along with all of the other floods that we saw last year. As I mentioned earlier this week, we've, we, we recently announced uh, the first phase of funding uh, for the Northern Rivers, and there's going to be a lot more to come because uh, mitigation thank you, matters. Minister, what your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, as first supplementary. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government's approach to disaster preparedness compares to previous Commonwealth government approaches? Uh, minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Well, I can. Um, and one, mil one, mi one minute will absolutely be enough time to outline uh, the Albanese government's approach and how that compares to what we saw from the former government. Uh, in fact, I could really just mention the former government's approach very quickly because the answer is not much. Uh, who could forget the former government's infamous nearly $5 billion emergency response fund? Established in 2019, in three years, the Coalition's Emergency Response Fund didn't release a single cent in recovery funding and didn't complete a single mitigation project. What it did do, of course, was raise nearly $1 billion in interest for the former government, while actually doing nothing to assist Australians with disaster mitigation or disaster recovery. Now, who knows what kind of damage could have been avoided, uh, what kind of loss could have been avoided if the former government had used that fund uh, in the way it was constructed uh, to provide for mitigation. Unlike the former government, the Albanese government believes in planning for future events, not waiting for Thank them to you, happen. Thank you, Minister. What your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister outline any threats to the Albanese government's commitment to ensuring Australians are better prepared and better protected from natural disasters? And Minister, before oh, they become humanitarian disasters. Sorry, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Sheldon. Uh, now, we have known for years that the federal government has needed to significantly increase its investment in protecting communities from natural disasters. All the way back in 2015, the Productivity Commission recommended that the federal government should invest $200 million every year in disaster mitigation and resilience across Australia. But what did the former coalition government do? absolutely nothing, as we saw in so many other areas of policy. For years, they ignored the advice of the Productivity Commission before eventually setting up this emergency response fund, which failed uh, to release a single cent in recovery funding and didn't complete a single mitigation project. In fact, when the legislation was being passed to create the then Emergency Response Fund, the only reason it even provided for mitigation funding was because Labor insisted on it as an amendment uh, when we were still in opposition. So it's no wonder that we have such a big backlog of mitigation projects right around the country. We're starting to work through that backlog with the Disaster Ready Fund, and I look forward to working with Thank states you, and Minister, territories your time to implement has expired. it. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you.
Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Fawcett. Thank Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of answers by the government to opposition questions number two and three. What we see in question time day after day is rhetoric uh, as opposed to reality. Before the election, uh, the rhetoric of the government was about no changes to superannuation. No changes to superannuation. But after the election, not just comments from the opposition, but if you look at the financial services media on the 28th of February this year, they said, and I quote, Labor's super tax reform moves the goalposts again, end quote. And so what the industry sector is saying is that this is a broken promise and the goalposts have been moved again. And I note that when it comes to goalposts, the Labor has form on this. In the area of national security and defence, the former defence secretary, uh, in, a, in a speech uh, here in Canberra, highlighted that the then Labor government made such a number of changes to strategic guidance and funding for defence that, in his words, the goalposts weren't just moved, they were cut down and used for firewood. And so when they come into this place and they talk about 10 years of wasted time, of the worst government ever, and they try and refer to things like defence, you have to compare the reality of what the former secretary highlighted of their poor governance, of their broken promises and their inadequate funding with the record of the coalition that actually increased funding from a record low since World War II up to an excess of 2 per cent, brought about things like the integrated investment plan to make sure that we had not only the headline capabilities but also all the enabling things like infrastructure that we need to have a capable defence force. And in estimates this year, the Defence Department confirmed that that was the first time a measure like that had taken place, which was actually some of the best governance they had seen in the area of defence. And so this rhetoric we see from those opposite about poor government, uh, which they also go to manufacturing. They talk about the fact that manufacturing has been downplayed, but what we see in reality was under the coalition government, things like the Modern Manufacturing Initiative actually led to a huge amount of investment and more apprentices in training than at any other time in Senator Australia's Reed. history. The reality under Labor now is that one of the most promising sectors in Australia's industrial sector, which the coalition invested in heavily and in fact established Australia's first space agency to give a focal point for investment, that this government in their industrial funding and their plan have omitted. And the space industry is alarmed at the lack of continuity and support from the government in this area. The other rhetoric we saw before the election, like the super, was around power prices. $275, we heard time and again from the government that their policies would drive down prices. But what we see in reality is that prices are going up. They went up 18 per cent last year. Today, in the paper, indications there'll be more pain with the standing offer planning to go up by nearly 20 per cent uh, because of the policies of this government, which are run, run largely on ideology and rhetoric. Because if you compare with other nations, and let's take the Biden administration in the US. Their Inflation Reduction Bill, which was passed last year, looks to reduce the cost of living and particularly one of the energy measures. So unlike the government here that says variable renewables will get us to net zero and will drive down prices, the Biden administration has taken the engineering and the science of people like the International Energy Agency, the OECD, the Princeton University report, and has said the science tells us that the cheapest way to get clean and reliable energy that will drive down emissions is to actually increase nuclear power in your economy. And so they have brought in tax measures to incentivise their industry to increase the nuclear power in the states from 92 gigawatts to nearly double by 2050. So that is policy that is based on evidence and science, not rhetoric. So whether we're talking about superannuation, 
whether we're talking about national security, whether we're talking about manufacturing, whether we're talking about cost of living or about having clean, reliable and affordable power, don't listen to the rhetoric of those opposite. Look at what they've done and compare it with the successful outcomes of people who base policy on engineering and Senator, science. Thank you. Senator, Senator White. Thank you. The reality is we've been upfront about the challenges that we've been inherited. We've been left with a trillion dollars of debt with little to show for it. You know, we've seen aged care in crisis and a decade of neglect in Medicare. So we've got to make tough decisions because people, at, people in Australia are making tough decisions around their kitchen table. So we, we as a responsible government, have got, got to make tough and responsible decisions around the, cab, the cabinet table. Back in 2016, um, the member for Hume talked about tough decisions when he said, well, it's very simple. We need a fairer superannuation system which has integrity. And this means that those of us who can afford to pay should be paying our fair share. The situation we, ha we had was some people were contributing millions of dollars into super, and it's totally inappropriate that someone who has contributed millions and millions of dollars continues to get 15% concessions. So who said that? That was the member for Hume in 2016, the current member for Hume, the shadow treasurer. So what we are doing is not just talking about it, we are looking at curbing tax breaks for those with over $3 million in super, a very small, modest change. So 30% of earnings over, 30% uh, on earnings over $3 million instead of 15%. It is still a tax, uh, it is still a tax break, and it is, it is but it is not uh, the 15 per cent, it is 30 per cent, and it affects a very small number of people, and it only takes effect in 2025. It will affect fewer than 0.5 per cent of Australians with super balances over $3 million. 99.5 per cent will see, of people in Australia will see no changes to their super. In contrast, those opposite froze the SGC three times in 2014, 2020 and 2021, and millions of Australians lost millions of dollars in super and will be poorer in retirement for, as a result of it. It wasn't 0.5 per cent who were affected by that SGC freeze. It was millions of Australians. I have seen myself personally many, many members of the, my former union who are going to live in poverty in retirement because those opposite froze the SGC, um, modest amounts of money, but big money for those people uh, who were affected. That's what you did in retirement. What we are proposing for those in retirement, what we are proposing is a modest, modest change. It is responsible, it's modest, and it's to keep super strong and fair. Super was designed to make sure working people have security and dignity in retirement. Your freeze of the SGC didn't deliver that in any way, shape or form. It is condemning people into poverty in retirement because you froze it three times—2014, 2020 and 2021. Women were badly affected by this, and it is on your shoulders. So to hear what, what I've heard in the last few days about this very modest um, proposal that is going to affect those, that, those uh, who have $3 million balances in super is, is just incredibly hard to take. But then what else would we expect from the people who have brought us robo-debt? Again, watching that Royal Commission and seeing what has happened to the, the poorest people in our society, how, how, as Alan Tudge said, we will find you, we'll track you down, and, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. That is your legacy. That is what you did. We are proposing a very modest change that is only going to affect a small number of people. And let's be clear, there were more people at the Ed Sheeran con concert last weekend in Melbourne than there are affected by these changes. That's the thing you should think about. The, and, and yet you, SGC, frozen three times. Millions of Australians lost money and are going to be in poverty and retirement because of what you did. We forget about that. Absolutely forget about that. 
And again, we've heard from the member of Fafadden admit for the Royal Commission that he lied about robo-debt because loyalty to his colleagues mattered more, not loyalty to the people of Australia. And what a perfect summary of this entire time in government that you had. Loyalty to yourselves, not to the Australian people. Senator Antic. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. The, um, the late great Margaret Thatcher once made the observation that um, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. Uh, and that is what the Australian people are in the early stages of uh, understanding as we speak right now. The Labor Party, however, do not understand that Senator this is Pratt. not uh, their money. This is not their money. We're dealing with the money of the Australian people, with the workers of Australia. Superannuation is not your money. It's not your money. You didn't work for it. And despite the assistant uh, treasurer's uh, views that we heard this afternoon repeated that uh, this was simply honey which could be taken from the hive, uh, this is not the manner in which the Australian people view their own hard-working savings. Um, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer uh, have basically gone back on their promise. They, 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 these are changes that they would said they would not make at the election. Uh, and we are seeing history repeating itself here with the same old, the same old Labor Party. This is, this is what I imagine uh, for the voters of Australia, the 31 per cent of them or 32 per cent of them or whatever it was, that voted Labor um, must have at least thought they were going to get something different out of the other end of the pipe. This is a bit like uh, what I imagine it must like, be like to be a North Melbourne supporter at the start of a football season, just thinking that the new season is going to bring something different. and yet come about round four, about where we're up to, all we're seeing is clangers and kicks out of bounds on the full. And, uh, so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, and, and, and let's be honest, despite all of that, it doesn't matter how many parades the Prime Minister goes off and, and marches in, doesn't matter uh, how many colourful parades he goes and marches in, doesn't matter how many uh, you know, all expenses paid trips he, he takes to go and visit the global glitterati, uh, the, uh, you know, the little fella from Ukraine, whatever his name is, in the green t-shirt. He's whatever his name is, anyway, who cares? Uh, he, he, it doesn't matter, nothing matters. It does not matter because ultimately, ultimately, well, I can't remember what his name is, he's just on the screen all the time. But anyway, um, it doesn't matter because ultimately what happens here is we get the same recycled product over and over and over and over again. They're making it up as this they go along. Senator Antix, sorry, oh, I oh, have here we go. Senator this is good. Seat. Senator Ayres. Point of order, I, um, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, that was an extraordinary reflection uh, on the uh, leader of Ukraine, uh, who, for I thought everybody uh, in this place, has been a symbol of uh, a, uh, a a very is, is important a struggle for for democracy and freedom. And you want to ask him to withdraw that? Uh, I will take some advice from the chair because Senator Shoebridge had my attention at the time. Thank you, Clark. Uh, there is no point of order on reflections on leaders of other countries, uh, but I will invite the senator to withdraw or, or contain his remarks, if he will. Just the uh, Senate, I'll withdraw any uh, in, improper applications, just making an observation as to his uh, appearance. But in any event, uh, we'll move on. So anyway, we'll move on. Uh, yeah, I've got Senator respect for democracy. I've got respect for Senator democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Interjections. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Acting De Deputy President. Now, what I was saying was that Labor are making this up Senator as they go along. And within the past two weeks, the Prime Minister has, let's go through this, the Prime Minister has refused to rule out further changes to superannuation. The Treasurer has refused to rule out changes to negative gearing. The Treasurer has also refused to rule out changes to capital gains tax, including the imposition on the family home. And then the Prime Minister uh, rushed out and said, no, we won't touch your house. And the Treasurer said, oh, well, I guess that's right. So we, we know where this is headed, Mr Acting Deputy President. We know it. This is a slippery slope. This begins and ends with CGT, with franking credits, with further shifting of the goalposts. That's, that is what we are seeing here. And as Peter Dutton points out ahead of the, lex, the, the election, Labor promised solemnly they weren't going to change the goalposts on super. The Prime Minister was unambiguous on that. And now 
less than a year into government—we're talking about 10 months into government—the uh, goalposts have been shifted. And it's clear that Mr Albanese and Dr Chambers, the Chalmers, uh, are coming after more of your money. We know that now. We've seen it. The Australian people have seen it, and it's too late for them. As they, Labor simply won't slow down on this. They can't control their own spending, and they won't, they won't stop coming after our money. And to believe them that they say out of $150 billion that they're going to be satisfied with $2 billion out of revenue is just an absurdity. It's just simply not, not going to happen. Uh, Bill Shorten was talking about this when he was the Labor leader. Uh, but at least in that instance, and we all remember that fateful campaign, Bill Shorten had the decency to be honest with the Australian people. And his plans uh, before the 2019 election, uh, unfortunately, this current Prime Minister can't do that. And on top of all of that, uh, the Labor's claim is plainly wrong. Their claim that the superannuation policy change will only affect 80,000 people uh, is wrong. Um, over the time, the number of Australians taxed will increase dramatically uh, because of the reasons I've already outlined. We know this coming after more. Labor's being tricky, and you cannot take Senator the Ideal. trust on tax. And the Grattan Institute has estimated within 30 years uh, about one in ten workers will begin to retire with super balances of around three million dollars. Senator O'Neill, I've called you a few times now. Please. Two hundred. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. That two hundred times more people than the government is claiming. Young people are going to lose out under this policy, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, an independent analysis has shown that a 25-year-old retiring in 40 years will see the tax on the super double, at Senator the equivalent Antic, of just a million dollars expired. today. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I just want to start by saying what an absolute disgrace that last contribution was to our parliament, an absolute Absolutely. disgrace on what I thought was bipartisanship, support of the efforts in Ukraine, their leader, President Zelensky. You might not care about our international relationships and the responsibility with which we carry that seriously, but we certainly take it seriously. We stood in the House of Representatives chamber exactly. all together with both leaders of the House, the both leaders of this place, all leaders of this place, in solidarity with Ukraine. Mere lip service, given what this senator has just said, and I'm not going to repeat the disrespectful comments. Lip service. That is all this government is former opposition is worth. This opposition is worth lip service. Absolute lip service, just like we've seen when, when the leader of the opposition Senator, talked about. Senator Stewart, can I bring you back to the, the question? That, he raised it. it? No, he raised that's, it. that's not what take note is for. I'm, I'm sorry. He I talked had, about the Prime Minister travelling. Please take your seat, Senator Stewart. I, I've had advice from the clerk that you need to be relevant to the question. I please just ask you to go back to the, the motions that were put by Senator Fawcett. Please re resume. Thank you. I, I was making comments, given that he raised them in, in his contributions to this parliament. I felt like it deserved a response to restate Absolutely. how seriously we there take are, our, our there are many um, opportunities relationships. to make contributions different to this, but this is you must be uh, responding to the question put by Senator Fawcett. Please. Thank you, Deputy Acting Chair. Back to the topic of superannuation. Once I calm myself after that dis disgraceful display, we've made our priorities clear as a government about who we stand for, and that is for the Australian working people. Those opposite have made it clear who they stand for. The 18 people, 17 people with over $100 million in their superannuation balance. One person with over $400 million in their super, superannuation balance, that's who they stand for. 0.5 per cent of the Australian population, some of the worst, wealthiest people in our, our country, and good on them, but they shouldn't be asking taxpayers who work on the factory line, our nurses and our teachers, to be paying the $2 billion that, in, in taxes that, that we will get from these changes in, in the first year. These are very modest, I know people love the word modest in this chamber, very modest and sensible changes. Yeah. Very modest and sensible changes. 
And we've already heard some quotes today from, from uh, those opposite who agree from back in 2016 about, about having to make some changes to, to the superannuation in this country. We are the government for the Australian working people. They are the opposition for the half a percent. It was great to hear Peter Dutton make his first election promise for 2025, reinstating tax breaks for those 17 people with over $100 million in their superannuation and for that one person, that one lucky person, Peter, Peter Dutton is on your side with over $400 million in your superannuation. We have finally found something the Leader of the Opposition will stand up for, show some spine for. It's certainly not veterans at risk of homelessness. It's not women fleeing family violence. It's not Australian manufacturing. It's not business looking for energy security. Not families seeking cheaper childcare. Not people needing cheaper medicine. Not households seeking energy bill relief. No to any of those things, but if you're one of those lucky 18, he's got your back. When it comes to the wealthiest half per half percent, those opposite have your back. Last week, we heard the federal member for Fadden admit to the, that, about the Royal Commission that he lied about robo-debt because loyalty to his colleagues mattered more than loyalty to the Australian people. Shame. What a perfect summary of the entire time in government. Loyalty to themselves and not to the Australian people. Shame. And I think it's a bit rich for those opposite to, to, to sit over there and talk to us about trust when I'm pretty sure that, I don't know, a, a, a former Prime Minister just appointing himself to a couple of portfolios might, might warrant or it might be considered a bit of a broken promise to the Australian people. I don't know, not being there when the country's on fire or going underwater might be considered a, you know, breaking a promise to the Australian people to have their backs. An absolute indictment. There were more people at the Ed Sheeran concert, thank you to Senator White for pointing this out, last weekend than there, were, than there will be affected by these changes. An absolute disgrace. We know who those opposite are on Senator the side Stewart, of. Senator Stewart, your time you has here. expired. Uh, Senator Ayres. Um, if I may, just on a point of order and seeking um, some further clarification, and I'm, and I'm happy, uh, 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 Mr Acting Deputy Chair, if you come back to the chamber later. Your, I, I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the contribution before, but um, you directed Senator Stewart to return to the, um, the uh, motion moved by Senator Fawcett uh, and indicated to her that she should uh, not continue to reflect on the comments that Senator Antic made. Uh, his extraordinary, I won't go into them, but extraordinary reflection uh, on the president of Ukraine. And I do accept uh, so, that, that, so, just that, 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 that Senator Stewart uh, did say that all of us were there for that photo uh, uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. It's, it's not the Senator, case that Senator, Senator Antic was there, is, but I would appreciate I would appreciate. What is your request? I would appreciate uh, some clarification of whether or not senators are entitled to reflect on the comments of the senators before them in the ordinary debate and the take note. Thank you, uh, Senator Ayres. As I as I said before, um, I was distracted by Senator Shoebridge when the remark was made, so I did not hear it. Uh, the clerk gave me advice that uh, the senator wasn't being relevant to the motion that had been put. Um, and that was the basis of, of my ruling. Um, if, you, if you accept that, otherwise I'm, I'm happy to go away and, and, uh, and review it with the clerks and come back. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, modest seems to be the word of this week. And uh, let me tell you, I certainly agree that Labor has much to be modest about, in fact, embarrassed about in relation uh, to their broken promises. So they might not think that modest changes matter, but absolutely on this side we know they do. There is nothing modest about their broken promises, and particularly in relation to superannuation. 
So it was modest because it only relates to a small percentage of hard-working Australians. What did they say? 0.5 per cent? But guess what? It was actually 10 per cent, and I wouldn't be surprised if it actually turns out to be much more than 10 per cent of hard-working Australians. And who are these hard-working Australians? They are the people who have worked hard all their lives to earn their money and to put money into superannuation. They are farmers, they are veterans on defined benefit schemes, and they are many other Australians. There is nothing modest about what you are proposing to do to them. And anyway, even if it was modest and not a broken promise, why are you doing this? Why are you t taking people's money away from them from their retirement if it is so modest? It does not make sense. So really, let's call a spade a spade. This modest proposal is actually a broken promise. So no matter how much they try to say modest, 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 every time the Australian people hear the Labor Party say that, it means broken promise and it means they are raiding your superannuation. Australians are very smart and wise people. They know their super is their money. It is not the government's money. It is not the union's money. It is not super fund money. It is their own money that you are taking from them, despite promising before the election that you would not. So let's have a look at what Labor actually promised every hard-working Australian in this nation. Before the election, Jim Chalmers, now the Treasurer, promised that there were going to be no new tax increases. He said those exact words. Labor has broken that promise. Labor has said it will now double taxes on super. And you really have to ask what will be next. Because once you know that once you've broken one promise, many others will come. They are clearly either being so duplicitous and frankly lying to the Australian people when they come, oh, well, we've just had this little idea here. It's modest. It's reasonable. We said we wouldn't do this before the election, but hey, it's modest. Let's just do it anyway and take people's money away from them. So in the last three weeks alone, the Prime Minister has not only refused to rule out further, further changes to superannuation, again, they said they would make none. The Treasurer has refused to rule out changes to negative gearing. The Treasurer has also refused to rule out changes to capital gains tax, including imposition on the family home. Then the Prime Minister rushed out and said, oh, 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 the Treasurer shouldn't have said that. Uh, no, we won't touch your house. But that is still not saying you won't make changes to capital gains tax. And then the Treasurer said, mm, uh, oops, sorry, I guess the Prime Minister is right. But clearly, the Prime Minister of this nation and the Treasurer of this nation cannot be trusted uh, whenever and whatever they say, particularly before what they said before the last election. And those of us who are old enough to remember previous Labor governments will know that this is Socialism 101. It is the politics of envy. It is the politics of division, because they start taking from people who have worked hard and have bigger bank balances, have bigger incomes, have bigger superannuation, and then they keep widening it and widening it and widening it so that so many working Australians who have worked hard for their money do not have it anymore. So what else have this government done? Um, since this government came into power less than a year ago, they have had nine consecutive interest rate, rate rises which is putting a profound stress on all Australians who have a mortgage. It's looking pretty grim out there, and everywhere I go, people are saying how much this Labor government has negatively impacted on their cost of living. And sadly, there will be more cost Thank of living pressures put on the, by this Labor government. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. So I'll put the question moved by Senator Fawcett. All those in favour, say aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Minister Watt in relation to silicosis. Um, 
And I was particularly troubled by the lack of any coherent response from the government regarding the insurance crisis in the industry and the impact that will have almost certainly on any worker who comes down with silicosis um, from this day forward and indeed going back to September of 2020. It's a fact that the major supplier of dangerous manufactured stone in Australia is Caesar Stone, and it's facing a global insurance crisis, leaving workers, fabricators and home renovators who contract silicosis with their product from their product without any protection. And I would have thought the government would be on top of that issue, because Caesar Stone is a company that's been allowed to recklessly travel down the same path of James Hardy in, that James Hardy did with asbestos, leaving thousands of injured fabricators and home renovators with a deadly disease and no insurance coverage to pay their claims. In many ways, the risks are even greater from manufactured stone than with James Hardy. Manufactured stone producers have no production facilities or other assets in Australia to make claims in the absence of insurance. James Hardy at least had assets in the jurisdiction. And so that means whenever Caesar Stone thinks it's no longer profitable to be involved in the Australian market, they can cease operating. And given the lack of insurance, there will be zero assets from which fabricators, home renovators, workers with silicosis can recover damages from. They will be left with a deadly disease and no remedy at all. This is why the Greens have been calling for a ban on silicosis since 2020. This is why we've supported the CFMEU's call for a ban. This is a deadly product in an industry that's been allowed to run like cowboys, completely like cowboys. Because of the known risk of silicosis litigation, it, Caesar Stone has been unable to obtain any insurance coverage for silicosis-related claims in Australia since September 2020. And most of the company's global insurance products actually have ex specific exclusions that mean they exclude damages related to exposure for hazardous dust, because the insurance industry has known for years about the deadliness of this, in, of, of this dust. And we know this not because of, the work, because of Safe Work's work in the space. Safe Work has been saying, oh, they can continue having the product provided everyone wears a mask and they do wet cutting and they um, have additional filtering. Safe Work has been complicit in allowing manufactured stone to continue to be used across the country and has been complicit in thousands and thousands of workers being exposed to toxic levels of silica dust leading to them contracting silicosis. Safe work is part of the problem. We know about Caesar Stone's lack of insurance, not because of Safe Work's um, activity in the space. We know because it's in the financial disclosures that Caesar Stone gives to the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And that makes it clear there is this complete absence of insurance. And I'll just read from part of that disclosure from Caesar Stone to the US Securities Exchange. It says in part, we, have, we currently have limited product liability insurance policies, which apply it to us and our subsidiaries and cover claims relating to bodily injuries, though in most cases these policies exclude damages caused by exposure to hazardous dust. That's what Caesar Stone is telling the US authorities, and that they say this. For example, as of September 2020, our Australian product liability insurance ceased coverage of newly diagnosed silicosis-related claims. Such events might have a materially adverse effect on our business and results of operations. They've, they've said it in black and white. And what's the Australian government done? Nothing to stop the product. What's safe work done? Nothing. Um, and, and, and it is deeply offensive, of course, when you read Caesar Stone's reports. The only thing they're concerned about is the cost of business. They don't once mention in their reports the likelihood in fact, the certainty of thousands and thousands of workers contracting silicosis because of this. They, um, Caesar Stone also said this, since 2008, we've been named either directly or as a third party defendant in numerous lawsuits alleging damages allegedly caused by exposure to RCS related to our products, filed by individuals, including fabricators and their employees and our former employees, their successors, employers, the State of Israel, and in subrogation claims made by the NII. Work cover of several states in Australia and others as of December 31, 2021, uh, we were subject to pending lawsuits with respect to 154 injured persons globally, of which 114 were in Israel, 38 in Australia and two in the United States. And we've received pre-litigation demand letters with respect to an additional 18 persons, in each case relating mainly to silicosis claims. 
And they say this since 2008 and through to December 31. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Your time has expired. Uh, I put the question moved by Senator Shoebridge. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh